We're okay. good. So what's the plan today? What's your what's what's on tap for Kyle? Yeah. So Mike, I have got a conundrum. Tomorrow is the first racing day of the season for me. So we're gonna do a test in tune on Saturday, and then we're doing an actual autocross on Sunday. Um the car, thanks to some of your help, is more or less ready to rock. Uh, took it out for a drive the other night, um, but excited to to get it back out on the tarmac. So my question for you in today's subject is, we've got this test and tune coming up tomorrow. What are some things that, and some backstory, I think this is my second or third test and tune ever. I'm still very new to this whole autocrossing thing. I'm loving it. I've done a couple events, but I'm still very much a novice and an amateur. With that test and tune coming up tomorrow, what are some of the Wait, things? Hold on. Yeah. Could you be, could there technically be an experienced novice? Because you said you're a novice and an amateur. So that's like a double novice, but I was wondering if you could do like, like maybe a professional amateur. Something like that. I'm an amateur with one season behind it. We'll put it that way. <laughs> um, like I have to say, we'll, we'll go through your, your three-year example here in a little <laughs> bit, but uh, that has always, you know, stuck in my head. Anywho, with this test and tune coming up tomorrow, I get more runs than I would normally. I get more chances in the car. My question to you is, if I'm trying to be faster, on an autocross course, what are some of the things that I need to be aware of, be thinking, and most importantly, be feeling in the car? I mean, autocross, we hear all the time, techniques like look ahead, drive the shortest line, walk the course. We hear a lot of course management, driving type things, but you're an expert in setting up cars and feeling for changes in an autocross. What are some of the things I need to be thinking about as I go out to this test and tune tomorrow? So when you're testing a car, um, one of the challenges for, for me, one of the challenges is I get all these thoughts in my head and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to, and, I'm gonna, and, then, and then we're going to, oh, you know, we get all crazy and we get all excited. Right. And really Test and tunes get soaked up really fast. And a lot of thoughts um, on what we're going to do. It, it's amazing how some of the simplest of tests can become a lot. Uh, so for me, looking back at it, and it's been really kind of interesting because I'm working with my son through his second, third year kind of a thing. He's in about that time of cars. Mm -hmm. um, and he's he's raced quarter midgets and go-karts and stuff too. But he's really focused on right now in his life, trying to feel different shock setups trying to feel different spring combinations. He's really keyed in on trying to be technical. Okay. And I find myself with him stripping it down. Like, hey, don't underestimate the simple progression. Okay. Don't overcomplicate it. So going into tomorrow, if this were me giving my son or you advice, really get down and dirty to something super basic because basics will absolutely open the doors for much more complexity. Okay. Okay. So the very first thing I would do, you just said this is going to be one of your first autocrosses for the year. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, um, you're going to be rusty. Mm -hmm. So, we might be going into this thinking shocks or springs or sway bars or engine management systems or um, all sorts of things. And you might get there and you just might be absolutely chowing the turns because you're just rusty. Mm -hmm. And I know my first 
autocrosses of each season, I definitely got to get myself re-geared up. I got to get myself back to speed. My timing, um, my look ahead points, you know, a lot of these things really do absorb a lot of your, of you. So you've got two parts. You've got one part car, one part driver. Mm -hmm. And then when you're doing testing and tuning, you really got to separate church and state. You got to really separate car and driver. And you got to be crazy honest. So let's say you don't know where you're looking. You don't know where you're going. You just didn't get enough walks on the course. Or maybe you forgot a segment. If you want to test and tune, you have to have that in the equation like a mathematical equation. Look, I totally got lost here. I had no idea where I went. So how do we test and get real data when the driver is a big variable? Okay. And what kind of data do we get? And this comes back to a lot of data acquisition systems that have been developed over the years. Solo, Storm, um, even GoPros have data logging in them. Like you can do uh, horse maps on GoPros. You can go do lateral Gs, accelerating, speedometer. They got a lot of neat. Uh, mapping courses, even just with the GoPro. Um, so there's all sorts of different cool data logging you can do. But data logging was developed because of the variable of the driver. Yeah. You might get uh, uh, some guy's kid, they got a lot of money and they're driving a car and the, the kid is just licking windows when he's talking to you about setup. He has no clue. He just knows he was racing in a car at the moment. Mm -hmm. So data acquisition was for people to try to pull information from what had happened. Sure. And so, um, so what happens is back to the thing. What's simple? You can take tire temperatures front to back. Okay. So, so really what you do is, is the, when you take tire temperatures, the common tire temperature thing is outside of tire, middle of tire, inside tire. Okay. Okay. And it's great to have a probe, like some kind of really neat long acre tire temp probe, but you can absolutely go to uh, Home Depot or Lowe's and get an infrared little temperature gun that you would shoot your air conditioning unit ducting with. Sure. Absolutely can use that um, and get an idea of what's going on. So what I would do with a tire with tires, the first thing I would do is if you're there by yourself, make your lap, get out of the car, don't talk to anybody and shoot the front tire and the back tire, not outside, inside, middle like what's typical, just literally shoot the middle of the front tire and the middle of the back tire mm -hmm. and see which end's hotter. Okay, so if we know which end's hotter, that end of the car is working harder. Makes sense. Okay. Now, last weekend we were running, I was running with, um, I was co-driving with um, a good family friend of ours, son, and he's getting up to speed with this car and I've been driving this car for a while. It's a Corvette we've been driving. And so I would jump out of the car and I would shoot tire temps front and back. And he actually was my, my tire warmer, if you will, but his first lap um, front tires were like eight, 10 degrees hotter than back tires, but the back tires were like at 95 degrees after the first lap. Okay. Front tires were like at 108, 110 so the first thing I look at, it was like, okay, that was a minute long lap. And you got, it's like ambient temperature outside is about 80 degrees. And you got the tires 10 degrees hotter than ambient temperature in the back. And they're hotter in the front. So this tells me the front tires were sliding more. They were working harder. And he wasn't on the gas. Mm -hmm. And then this also tells me that maybe he was kind of cruising along and he was grabbing a handful of steering wheel. 
Okay. You know, working that front tire a little extra harder than maybe the back. And then he was, maybe he was nervous on the way the car felt to get on the gas. Okay. But we don't know this, but we do know front tires are hotter than the back. Mm -hmm. We're working the fronts harder. And we also know that the tires aren't very warm. So then I go out and my back tires, well, before I even said anything, I said, okay, Mike, next lap, you got to get up on the gas. You got to throttle it up, dude. Every time you get a chance, you got to be rolling your foot into that throttle. Mm -hmm. So that's step number one for test and tune. Okay. We looked at front tire temp. We looked at back tire temp. We weren't even tripping out about across the contact patch yet. We were just looking for macro adjustments. Okay. Okay. And then I got in the car. The back tires were 15 degrees hotter than the front tires. Hmm. I was all over the throttle. I, I've been driving the car for a while. I've got laps in for the season. I was way more on the pipe right out of the gate. And he was catching up because he's still fresh and he's still trying to figure it this setup out so for him i started working on we would make a change and it was a simple change something basic and when i would look at him i didn't want a lot of technical information don't get technical about it was the car better was it worse or did you not know because if you don't know if there's a, if the change made a difference, a lot of times that's really actually a telling story because if you're going to make a change and I'm, I'm going to come back, I'm going to reel it back here. Let's say you're going to make a change and the car, the front, the front of the car is sliding more than the back of the car. That can be not enough rear spring. It can be not enough front sway bar. It can be too much front sway bar. It could be not enough rake. It could be too much front spring. Mm -hmm. It can be all sorts of things. It could be alignment. It could be the way you're driving it. All of these things are very real that can make a car act a certain way. And all of those changes can affect understeer. Well, and I, so, want, I want to stop you there real quick because I do have a well, question. I want to go back even further. Well, hold on real quick. So I what happens what? is, what happens basically is you can change seven out of eight things and have it all be the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And then when you change the eighth thing, it's like, boom, it's in your face. You know it. So if the driver doesn't know, that's okay. It's information. Mm -hmm. So coming back to your first day, front tire, back tire, I felt it. I didn't feel it. And then you brought yourself up to speed. Well, what I want to do is I want to dig in just a, you brought up an interesting point a second ago. You said something about, is it better or is it worse? Trying to keep it simple. Was the car better or was the car worse? Define that to me, though. Was the car better? Is this a measure of was the car faster? What do you mean when you say was the car better or was it worse? What <clears throat> what's that? So that's actually really, really good. Um, it's quite literally that. It's, it's when you're driving a car, you have to be comfortable, whether you're on a street, whether you're on a track, um, you have to be comfortable. If you're driving down the highway and you're going to go on a six hour drive and you're going to drive down to New Mexico or something and see the national forest there, or whatever, wherever you are in the country, you're going to go for a drive in your Mustang. If the car rides like shit, it's going to wear you out. It's not going to be fun. You're going to be irritated, right? If you're doing 130 miles an hour around a turn and you're clipping a curb at a track, you know, because you're cutting the line and you're, you're trying to shorten the distance up, and the car bounces off and it clangs and bangs and you're just you're just holding on for dear life because the car jumped really weird over the over the curbing mm -hmm. versus going bloop, bloop, you know like a nice trophy truck over a bump bloop, bloop. it needs to be able to take a bump without upsetting the car you need to drive the car down the highway without it being irritated and darting and hunting 
So if you guys, you know, while you're testing, you, you isolate something or maybe, or so you, you want the car to be easy to drive. If there's anything happening, let's say the front tires are sliding a lot. Mm -hmm. That means you're constantly dealing with it. If the back tires are sliding a lot, you're constantly dealing with it. Really a fast lap at an autocross should be really boring. You should step on the brakes and the whole car should go boo. And then you should step on the gas and the car should go boo. Not that's that's not good. Really great engines. When you get on the gas, the power delivery is so smooth. It never surges. It doesn't do anything weird. It doesn't blow the tires off. Like all of a sudden you're in the gas and the car is kind of going and all of a sudden the tires start smoking. Great engine builders don't build engines that do that. Hmm. Okay. They build, sounds crazy, the velocity in the heads, the piston size, the RPM range, the intake design, all of that should be when a driver puts their foot down kind of like an idiot. Hmm. The power feeds super linear because the engine builder knew how to get the airspeed to be linear. Hmm. Okay. That's, that's a thing to all another subject, but everything should be really boring in the car. Some of the greatest drives I've ever had are some of the most boring laps. You just get in the car and you just drive it and you steer and you step on the brakes and the car stops. And then you kind of look over there and I want to go over there and you turn and the car just kind of leans and it grips and it never slid, never locked up the brakes. And then you get in you, and your time, you're like, oh, okay, well, that was good. And you're like a second and a half ahead of the whole field. Hmm. But if you're sliding and working and the car is all over the map and, and you feel like you're smoking the bandit, <laughs> you know, and you're going nuts, chances are you're not going to be fast. So let me ask you this then. In this circumstance, comfort is what we're after, right? Is yep. control the equivalent of comfort in this circumstance? I mean, are we looking for control the entire time? Is that what we're after? And that's the mark of a better lap? Yeah, you want to be able to put the car where it needs to be with the least amount of brain power. Hmm. Okay. If you're working your head and you're trying, you know the car is going to do some weird shit over this next bump. Or maybe it's going to surprise you. And you, the last previous couple turns were really squirrely. So this next turn, are you going to go into it at 10 tenths? Hmm. No, you're not. Because the car might surprise you with some stupid stuff. So really what we're talking about here is it's a measure of being able to put the car where you want to put the car. With very little fanfare. With right. very little effort. So Anytime you, you got... What? So I said, so your expectation then is as you go out and as you keep running more and more laps, especially if you're doing a test and tune, that you're trying to do a better job of getting the car where you expect the car to be. Yeah. And, and the way you do that is you find the crappiest thing about your car. Okay. And sometimes we have a hard time figuring that out. Like you become climatized to your own thing. Like we were joking earlier about you know, you could be dating a supermodel and she has super stinky breath, right? Mm -hmm. And then you become climatized to that stinky breath and everybody else is like, oh, dude, but you don't smell it. Uh -huh. You know, that's the same thing as with your car. It's, it's sometimes you need to find someone else that's out there that's not like-minded to you. Someone else that's a, that's a solid driver, someone else that's a, someone that's not going to destroy your car you watch the field you get to know people and you get them to either ride with you or drive your car a couple laps i i had a buddy of mine he's got this beautiful car i mean i've, I've known about the car my entire life and he's on the show circuit he does all sorts of really wonderful work to his car and i mean he was on the cover of a magazine with my dad in 84 mm -hmm. right i mean this guy's been around for a minute and, and he came out to the autocross and I was like, I was helping his son out and I was helping his son. I looked at Chuck and it was really odd because I normally don't do this. I normally don't 
say it like this, but I looked at Chuck and I said, Chuck, would you like me to drive your car? And he goes, he goes, well, no, no, no. Cause he didn't. And it wasn't no, because he didn't want someone driving his car. He's the type of guy. He wouldn't want to put you out. Mm, okay. I said, Chuck, give me the keys to your car. And I think he was nervous. I was going to beat on it. Right. Cause this car drives to all these car shows. He does track days with it. He it's a driver's car, but it's beautiful. And I realized two things about this car. I let the clutch out and I, I roll in the gas. I don't hammer the gas. The car is gutless. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to say anything because he it's the only car he's really ever had like this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, and I know he, had, he just had the motor built, but he doesn't know. Right. He, he's climatized. And I was like, this thing's a turd, <laughs> you know, and. But you don't really, you don't, you're, you're picking low hanging fruit for the customer, right? You don't want to kick them into shins, but you want to give them something that they can learn and, and, and do easy so they can have a win. And I go to step on the brakes into the first turn and the car just freaking didn't stop. It just didn't stop. And, and he had bare brakes on the car and it wasn't bare. It's not bare. That was the problem. It was the fact that he had the wrong brake pad on the car. The car just absolutely had no bite in the pad. And he had been driving the car like this for years. And he thought, I have these brakes. The brakes are good. That's how it is. And I looked at him like, your brakes are terrible, dude. But you don't have to change the bear. You just need to start looking for pads. And then next thing you know, he spent like the next season just working on finding different brake pads and testing pads. And all of a sudden, he comes back to me at the end of the season. He's like, dude, I learned so much about brake pads. And it was just brake pads. Mm -hmm. Now the car is predictable. It's easy to stop. Because you need to be able to reach over and touch the brake without pulling on the back of the steering wheel. It just needs to be a natural movement, almost like you don't even know you're doing it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, tomorrow when you're doing your test and tune, something that stands out that's keeping you from being confident mm -hmm. keeping you from allowing yourself to go further harder into the turn is really what you're looking for so the first test and tune i would be saying a couple of basic things i'd say number one you have to be aware of you and your driving you have to do your best to be consistent to be a test pilot you have to be repeatable and you have to be able to do the basic right things. Don't brake too late. You remember your basics. Brake, pick the throttle up lightly, and then roll the turn. Mm -hmm. you, that's hard unto itself. Once you're repeatable there, then you can get repeatable results out of your car. Okay. okay? And then once you, then what you do is you're taking tire temps front to back. The first couple laps, get a rough idea of which end of the car is working harder. Once okay. you learn that, then you can start attacking uh, maybe what you might think might be the issue. Okay. Play with, you know, front to back macro tire temperature differences aren't a tire pressure thing. That's a balance thing. It's either you're driving too hard into the turn and you're understeering, your chassis balances off and you're understeering, or uh, maybe you're oversteering too much because your chassis balance. And then what you end up doing as the season goes on, the next event, you start focusing on outside, middle, and inside tire temperatures. Okay. Okay. So you'll grow into that as the next one. So outside, middle, inside, if the outside of the tire is too hot, then you don't have enough camber. Or you might not have, you might uh, not have enough caster. You got, you're wearing out that outside edge of the tire. If the center of the tire is too cold, like you can't, if it's five degrees cooler in the middle, then it means that you need to put more tire pressure in the car to hold that center of the tire down to the ground. So many people do the, the wrong thing and they go low on tire pressures, thinking that it's going to gain them grip and gain them that little side bite they're looking for. Mm -hmm. When really what it does, it takes that tire, each sidewall is designed to be rigid. And you go into a turn and it buckles the load pushes on the sidewall and it lifts the center of the tire up. Mm -hmm. 
And so you'll roll a turn and all of a sudden the car starts to slot. You'll roll a turn, that's cool. And then you add a little more and the tire goes boonk. And it lifts for a second. And you can see that in like what we would commonly think is other people's rubber down the center of the tire. Mm. You'll see OPR, little specklets of like rubber that are sticking to the middle of the tire. Mm. And it's really your outside sidewall sh cheese grating the rubber into the center of the tire when the center of the tire is lifting off the ground and light and it accumulates in that void. Hmm. Which and probably so you, doesn't do you any favors for when you get back to unfolded and you've got a bunch of crap in the middle. Right, right. But you're too low on tire pressure, so it doesn't matter. It always lifts when you need it. <laughs> so, so it doesn't matter. Right. So you want to raise the tire pressure until the center temperature of the tire is equalish to the outsides of the tire. Hmm. Okay, so you really would want like a, 10 degree slope you want the outside edge of the tire 10 degrees cooler than the inside mm -hmm. by five degree increments that's a good starting point and you want the front tires to be the same general temperature as the back tire mm. okay so that's kind of your goal um and then but i didn't know what i was doing i still generally don't if you, but the way i learned a lot of these things was i literally was relentless at watching my tire tread depths and my tire temperatures okay. and i would watch my tire temperatures during the day while i was racing and a lot of times you can't do anything about it that day it's like maybe changing springs or shocks at the event really isn't an option depending upon the event mm -hmm. but when you get home you could also back to back that to your tread depths you can get those little long acre tread depth gauges Mm -hmm. and you can check your tread depths before and after every weekend and you can back up your tire temperature data so if you see the front tires are hotter than the back you might see yourself wearing out the front tire faster than the back mm -hmm. right so you'll see maybe the tire starts at 7 30 seconds and the front you're done with the full weekend of racing the front's down to you know five and a half 30 seconds and the back's still at seven mm -hmm. you, it's obvious you have an imbalance there now it's time for you to go hunt find out what the problem is right i mean because like i was saying earlier there's so many different things you can do to 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 adjust your car but one of them is right mm -hmm. with your situation your 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 set of facts so really your first test and tune should be get your driving up and going. Mm -hmm. Focus on you. Be repeatable. Know the course. Practice that in your head. It's going to take you three, four weekends to really get that dialed. Mm -hmm. So you're starting uphill tomorrow on that. Know that. The second thing is don't over tech mm -hmm. the test and tune. Do, do front tire attempts, rear tire attempts confirm what you're doing if you got a chance get someone else if your car's running well and everything seems to be good nothing's going to blow up and fall off of it get somebody else to drive a couple laps in your car hmm. get them to tell you the hard truth and tell them look i don't want to hear how great my car is i want to hear how one really terrible thing about my car mm -hmm. because then now you have something to work towards well, and it sounds like that's a really invaluable part of being out at the autocross, right? Is being able to ride along with other people, have other people ride along with you, have people drive your car. It sounds like you're a big proponent of that. Oh, huge. I see people all the time. They're like, oh, nobody drives my car. <laughs> I'm like, what? Well, I guess, whatever, dude, you're going to, you're going to be wherever you're at forever because you're not getting outside influence. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that, that whole thing just baffles me some of the greatest help i've ever gotten is from other people's input mm -hmm. well, you know my like autocross right. one of the few racing sports where you can really do that right it's one of the few places where swapping rides riding along with other people is is really encouraged yeah it well and that's the thing right um kind of why i i ended up falling into the rut of autocross over all these years and no matter what other racing we've done over the years we always come back to autocrossing 
or we've never left it during all of these other racing exploits we've done um, because there's no other sport with a car where excuse me where you can um you can run so much you can run every weekend and people talk about seat time oh i do this because i get more seat time well no dude you're at the track five times this year mm -hmm. so you loaded your car five times you unloaded it five times sounds funny you you pack your ice chest five times and so therefore really a day is only a day just because you wore your stuff out more than somebody else doesn't mean you actually because what you'll tend to do like, let's say you're going to go to a track session a track day you'll go out and say okay i'm going to work on early apexing or late apexing or i'm going to work on this thing for this session so i spend 20 minutes potentially doing something wrong for 20 minutes because just because you think you're going out and doing something right Maybe someone's not riding with you. So now you just wore your stuff out for 20 minutes. And so you had four sessions that day. So you got four opportunities to make four different changes. Now you take that and say, okay, I'm an autocrosser. I'm going to run because I can afford it now because I autocross. I don't, I don't have the track fees. I don't spend $250 or $400 a day plus the wear and tear on my car. I, I can go now 15 weekends a year. I can go 20 weekends a year. And I can load my car 20 times, unload my car 20 times, pack my chest 20 times. When you do it more often, what that does, you get into a, a, a repetition and that load of all those peripheral bull crap things that just take mind power, they become um, second nature. And it opens up bandwidth for you to focus on your testing tube. Hmm. But when you're sitting there and you forgot your, your suntan lotion, you didn't pack your water right, registrations moved, you don't know where you're going, you're kind of really soaking up a lot of bandwidth in stuff that has nothing to do with the track. Hmm. Right? It's all logistics. Mm -hmm. So as an autocrosser, I feel that you then go four laps or five laps and if you start getting good at it, you can do all the testing in one lap that this other guy took 20 minutes to figure out. It takes a while to get there, but all of a sudden you start seeing, like I'd say the general people with real jobs, not ginormous money, um, who can afford to be there on a regular budget, you'll see autocrossers having conversations about debates about three-way adjustable shocks. You'll see autocrossers talking about tire technology, unlike most other um, groups of people. You'll see guys talking about, oh, I did this offset my, with my wheel, or I'm using this ABS system, or I'm, I changed master cylinders and we're doing this, this, this. Because we can do it all the time, because the budget's not so high. Does that make sense? And then the more you do it, it frees up that bandwidth and the more you can get focused on your, um, on your, um, on yourself. Well, I think that's a big part of the appeal of autocross is its approachability, right? I mean, not only do you get more opportunities to go out and do it, but the cost of entry is lower. It's easier on the cars. There's very little risk of running into something or someone, um, it's just a very approachable form of racing. Um, so along those lines, it sounds to me like you're very scientific in how you approach autocrossing, right? It's not just going out and ripping it around the course and, wow, that was fun, and put it in the trailer and go home. As you're approaching these things, are you writing these down? Do you have a logbook of sorts? What do you do to keep data moving forward uh from one session to the next well how do you take what you've learned and apply it to future sessions you, you know what's funny is i was thinking about that this morning i have a setup sheet that i should get you to link to this video okay you know so or link on our website to where or maybe in our installation instructions 
so you can just upload that setup sheet and print it out. Sounds funny. It's so important. It has shock settings, sway bar settings, um, Those higher temperatures. Fill in the sheet kind of thing. Yep, you fill in the sheet. You do your very best to fill in the sheet every time. And my personal process is um, before I go out, I do my baseline. I try to measure my shock settings. I try to note where my springs are. I try to note where my sway bar settings are at. Um, I note my ride heights. I I personally built a, a setup table um, where I have scales that are all even. So the car rolls up on the sca setup scale. There's a table. I do all my baseline settings and I scale my car there. I know that's not an option for some people, but even measuring your shocks, settings writing down your springs writing down sway bar settings your ride heights your alignments and then i also take tire uh tread depths mm. before i go and then what i do is i run my weekend and um once i'm done running my weekend i'll make a bunch of changes throughout the weekend and i kind of i know some people get rarely focused on making like notes of every single lap Dude, there for me there's not enough i i can't i can't note every lap but what i can do is i can believe myself in the in the trend in the direction that i went for the weekend mm -hmm. so this last weekend we were running we were, were crossing this corvette from we ran two cars we ran the corvette and we ran old blue the corvette's been a good guy's car for a long time and good guys is like 15 miles an hour mm -hmm. um like turns 20 miles an hour straight away is hit like 55 and then but the car is meant to turn at really low speeds so our control arm angles are quite extreme to get the car to nose over and rotate hmm. um we found ourselves over springing the car to make up for our extreme control arm angles we didn't catch up to that so then we started going wait okay we're seeing this trend all day saturday we kept going and the last event, we kept adding spring, adding spring, adding spring. And we started noticing, because another thing we do is we we compress springs between events too and bump rubber packages to see what our cumulative spring rates are. And we're noticing that we're going crazy on our spring rates. Well, it turned out we wrote down all those numbers from the previous event at, after the event. Then we made a change during the week. Then we recorded all of our changes. Then we went to the event and we started noticing, wait a minute, the control arm angles are really steep. So we flatten the arms out for the next day. And all of a sudden we can mellow out all the springs because we were over constraining the chassis because we had too steep of control arm angles. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, shoot. So for me, I didn't really need to write all that down throughout the weekend. Like, oh, I put an eighth inch spacer here and I did a quarter inch spacer there. It was more of a general trend, right? And then at the end of the weekend, on Monday, actually, on the beginning of the week, I'll generally sit down, I'll recheck tire tread depths again. I'll write, because the tri tire tread depths, outgoing and incoming is tremendous. It proves or disproves everything you did so if you've got you're wearing out front tires before the rears or vice versa you're trying to find that balance do you want them all to be used equally so you can confirm your changes by tread depths hmm. you, right and it, there's no bullshit in a tread depth so so you sit there and you go okay um where did we end up then you measure your arm angles. Then you measure your shocks and your spring combinations. Then you do this. And and maybe you don't have an answer. So like that setup sheet, we would do springs, we would do shocks, we would do bars, all these things. And then we would we would rewrite it again on Monday. Friday outgoing, Monday incoming. And sometimes we don't even know what the hell that means, honestly. Mm -hmm. You don't just divinely know that the instant centers and the spring rates are doing this you just don't know that but then you might be able to step back up mid-season and see this trend mm -hmm. you almost use these setup sheets like a graph i'm i keep trending this way 
something keeps pushing me that way. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're out there having a beer with your buddy one day and you're like, Oh dude, Mike, what I'm hearing then is a, a lot to learn still. I, you know, adjusting coil springs, adjusting spring rate, adjusting all of that is still elements that variables that I can learn to tweak with time. But what I'm hearing and what I'm taking away from what you're saying is get in the habit of recording data, treat it like a science experiment. And you might not know what all that data means, but get in the habit of trying to record it. Try and record your thoughts as you're driving the car. If there are Dude, things that cause you to your, finish, right? Yeah, on your way home, mm -hmm. record stuff on your way home. It's still fresh, it's still good. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that over time, this becomes a data pool to pull from, right? So what we're looking for is a trend, a Ooh, that felt kind of, I didn't feel comfortable in that turn. What was it about that turn? Maybe it was a little dip or maybe it was a bump or something. And that might be a clue to something that needs to be adjusted. It's, it's not so much a instant, oh, I know what this problem is, as it is, let's chase things down and kind of see what's going on, what's repeatedly happening that we're noticing and what might be the cause of those problems. Dude, the fact of the matter is a car is like a tremendously complex operating system. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's just a motor, a transmission and four wheels, you still have the flex of the chassis. You have the stack up of the components. You have the damp, the dampeners, uh, the ramp angles of the spring rates. You got the tires folding up. It's a tremendously complex system. And so the hunt for the feel is is like ongoing it's like forever mm -hmm. right and that's why you don't see people stop it's like it's like you're always on this hunt and so yeah take it as a marathon don't take it as a sprint tomorrow see if you can find something macro you know something big and mm -hmm. don't over don't over complicate the moment mm -hmm. write notes down let it marinate and and if you're if you're kind of stuck and you're not really sure sounds crazy dude but like dude you you you've got your girl have her co-drive mm -hmm. like get her into into the seat because it'll happen two things will happen with that i always tell people everything the best thing you can do is get your girl to co-drive because you get someone else into it with you you can enjoy it together. She's not there just watching you and getting bored because mm -hmm. that'll only last so long before you're there by yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is what I always say about the ladies is a guy will frame the house. The girl makes it a home, mm -hmm. right? That's the same thing with the car. A dude puts the engine in, gets the fenders on, does all the stuff. But then she gets in and says the seat's not in the right spot. And you're like, what do you mean? It's a fucking seat. You know, it's a seat. And then, and then, so then what ends up happening is, is you'll find out that, you know, she's actually right. If you sit like this, then you can see better and it's more comfortable. And then why is the shifter way over there? I can't reach it. You might pass it off as something that's not really worth thinking about, but then you do what she says that you move the shifter. All of a sudden it's nicer. And this comes into what it takes to make a great street car, what it takes to make a great car in general, is you're just getting rid of the things that make it difficult and focusing on making it nicer. And that and maybe it's a co-driver. Maybe you find, maybe you don't have a girl and maybe you, you look for a co-driver you work with well, someone in the pit that seems to be pretty cool and fun. Excuse me. Someone is kind of fun. And so what you do is... You get someone that that helps you find these things, you know, just to make the car better and better and better, not stiffer, not gnarlier. I mean, maybe stiffer is better. Who knows? Right. Mm -hmm. But that's what makes a really great car is that that growth, that continuous nonstop growth. 
So there's one other thing I want to touch on before we wrap up today. Um, we talked a little bit about data acquisition systems, something as simple as a GoPro and as complex as, I mean, you name it, you can have all kinds of onboard wires and cameras and stuff running, right? Where do you stand in terms of using some of these tools that are available to us? As a beginner, I don't have like Solo Storm set up yet, but I've I've looked at it. Is that a meaningful tool for someone just getting started or is it more of a feel thing? Okay, so that's kind of funny because everybody knows me as like the hammer and chisel guy. Like, <laughs> you know, um, people absolutely think that I'm not a tech guy. Um, but honestly, I really think tech is super important. I really think um, everybody learns differently. So you really got to be keyed in on how you want to learn or how you learn. And you have to test a few different things, you know, a couple of different systems that maybe you communicate with well. So um, we started with video years ago. Um, we also had, um, oh man, there was, we had this, uh, we've done a number of different, uh, tech data acquisition systems since the nineties. Um, we, we used to strap on, um, your blackberries into the center of the console of the car. And then we, oh man, I forgot the name of these data act systems, but we've done Pi. Pi was an early data acquisition system where we would use, um, shock potentiometers, steering potentiometers, where you have pulleys off the steering wheel and all these different really cool things. And, um, and what data tends to do is it tends to show you what you did. So if your processor isn't, isn't working at a, would it, at a fine enough rate, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's like your baud rate, isn't that right? If your baud rate's too slow, you're going to pick up two macro fragments of the turn. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be able to pick up all the moments in between. You're not going to be able to remember, was I on the outside of the turn? Was I on the inside of the turn? If you're new and you've got a lot of things coming at you, you're, you're um, like I was saying earlier, you're, you're really, you don't have enough bandwidth, then data logging is really great to see where you were on the track see how many g's you pulled did did i i made a change did it actually improve my cornering speed look i made a change i can hit that apex every time now you can see it on my solo storm mm -hmm. right so i think a lot of people use data because they can go back and look at the information and and confirm or deny what they did. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So finding your system, and you can spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. There's no end to data logging. When we were driving to Cobra last year, uh, Bruce would literally spend weeks and weeks and weeks sifting through the data. From I would make a sway bar change, and he would tell me the, the rate of yaw change. So that from left to right, how fast the car changed directions based on the sway bar change. So he being an engineer would confirm or deny our sway bar change as being a real thing right there on the moment from the pit, hmm. right? Um, so you could do all sorts of data logging. Me, I always feel like if my carburetor is falling on its face and it's not going, I don't need a computer to tell me that. Mm -hmm. you know but maybe you can use the computer to tell you if that was a lean stumble or a fat stumble mm -hmm. like you know, lean conditioning or a rich condition you know what i'm saying gives you a little so, more data behind the idea what? gives you a little more information behind the data point yeah so if you're looking for data logging if that's you know if that's how you communicate well absolutely do it there's there's a number of different systems out there from aim um i don't know if they're even doing it i think that's some of the early ones aim there's uh most like haltech and all these other things today 
they have uh, GPS sensors in their systems and they can tell you what they're doing, what you're doing, um, the, the, how many channels you have in the system. Um, you can go bananas. One of our data logging things that we did this last weekend, we put a rod on our um, coilovers parallel to our coilover. We made a, we made like a bracket that, that the spring um, goes up against in the spring seat that holds a little aluminum rod that goes through another bracket on the bottom of the spring with a hole in it. And that rod goes through the bottom bracket. It's bolted to the top one. And there's two rubber O-rings that you sandwich on the, on the bottom bracket. And then when you go through your lap, that suspension's moving up and down and it pushes the rubber O-rings away from the bottom bracket. And we can see with this spring package, we went to five eighths of an inch of movement. We can go back to our spring squash chart and five eighths of an inch of compression means we got up to about eight, no, no, got to about a thousand pounds of spring pressure. We make a, we can make a shock change or a spring change and we can see what pressure we got to live time. So we're very analog in our data logging, but we're definitely not done a lot of development to find out what these numbers are. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I've got a lot of laps and my, my, my superhuman strength is splitting up laps in the moments of my head. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so everybody's going to do their own thing. For me, it was constant recording before and after the event. You know, I recorded before the tires of this, after the tires of that. Mm -hmm. I just did that. My shock settings were this. My shock settings were that. Every time I go over here, the car goes fast. Um, and you can rate yourself, too, with PAX. So PAX is a driver index that you can see, like when you go to autocrosses. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a lot of times your, your personal result in your class. And a lot of autocross groups will have a PAX or an index, like a handicap, okay. on where you rank as a driver overall so maybe you're the only cam car at in your region how do you know how well you did this weekend versus next weekend mm -hmm. rank yourself against the other drivers i'm normally two seconds off of this guy he seems to be really consistent i made a spring change i'm 1.5 seconds off of him now ah so it's like a floating point of reference basically yeah you want to find your distance ahead of other people and behind other people you make a, a suspension change and all of a sudden this dude behind you is kicking your butt. He never kicked your butt before. Mm -hmm. That's got to tell you, did, was it just him making a change or was it the whole group passed you up? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, getting back to, to what I'm getting from this conversation there, there are so many variables in a car. There are so many areas to tweak. There are so many things that can be changed. There are so many things to keep track of. But what I'm hearing is, Go out there, make it a habit to record data that you can, that makes sense. Use sheets like the one that we're going to link to this video. Even uh, if it doesn't make sense, record data. It makes sense. Just get in the habit of recording that data. And then start with one or two points. This weekend, I'm going to go out and I'm going to look at tires. And I'm just going to measure the temperature difference from front to rear. And I'm going to see what that looks like. If Perfect. I'm five, six, seven runs deep, I might just for kicks and giggles, do some measures on the, you know, inside, middle, outside, just to see what that data looks like. Not necessarily to make any changes with it, but just to record it and see and, how it goes. And it's got to happen really fast, right? When you come in, you can't come in and, and daddle. You, you can't be dinking around talking to your buddies. So I shouldn't squirt the tires first is what you're saying. No, no, <laughs> no, you need to, even if you can get your girl to do it, like before you get your helmet off. Okay. And so when you do your tires, yeah. And even sometimes I'll do one side of the car mm -hmm. and then I'll go out and make my lap again and I'll do the other side of the car. Mm -hmm. So I don't take the time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so that's, that's my key takeaway. The other thing that you said to me years ago was this notion of your first three years of autocross. Do you remember, do you remember what that was? Mm -hmm. Walk us through that because that has always stuck with me. And I think it's such great advice for beginners. Yeah. So first year, you think you're racing, you're showing up to the events. And really the whole time, like, it's like, for me, this is how it went. And this is kind of generically how I see it with most people. 
if they stick it out. By the Christmas, by the end of the season, around Christmas time, once the dust settles, you're sitting there and you're having your cocktail at the fireplace. You realize at the end of your first year, you thought you were racing the entire time, but really you're reflecting that you know where grid is, you know who the grid, uh, you know where tech is, you know where registration is, you know that you need to bring your sunblock, you know that all these basic things, I forgot my tire pressure gauge, I always put my tire pressure gauge here, you get your kit together, you get your, you, you understand your surroundings, that's a lot, though there's a hotel room down there, don't stay in that one, that one sucks, you know, it's like, you, you'll find these things out, right? And all of that takes a ton of bandwidth. People don't give that enough credit on the peripheral BS of just getting to the event. Um, Mondays are freaking hard after an autocross weekend. So, okay, so that's the first year you realize how to get to the event. You understand the logistics of the event. By the Christmas time, the winter time of the second season, you thought you were racing again all year. You thought you were doing it all, but this year you opened up some bandwidth because now you don't have to think so much about tech, registration, all that. It's more second nature. you got that down now. You say hi to the people. Oh, hey, what's up? You know, it's easy. But the second year, you've realized don't follow Bob around the course. He has no clue where he's going, right, when you're walking course. Follow this person, follow that person. You start learning about how to walk a course, where, how to set up the next turn, if you will. I'm going to make a right here, so I got to stay hard right, hard right to make the next left, you know. Just you're starting to become aware of the track. I mean, the whole time you thought you were, but you really weren't. You were just going through the motions. By the end of the second year, you understood there's certain people to follow, certain people not to follow, and there's a certain way to run the track. And then by the end of the third year, you are now aware that there's a car there. And you thought you were doing all these things and you were, you were making changes and, and you were feeling these things, but you couldn't really dial in on spring changes and, and bar changes and, and tuning changes for your mapping of your motor and all that stuff. If you didn't know where registration was and you didn't know where you were driving. So, like, how do you really focus on these things if you're going like the turn up there? You know, it's it's not really possible. So, I mean, you're gonna do it. It's possible, but you may suck at it. So, really, first year, the logistics of the event. Second year, it's the um, there's a course there. Third year, there's a car there. Now you start hammering after that, and so that's really kind of the jam. I mean, that's the basics and you can speed that up you can co-drive with someone who's been doing it forever and just be the driver or what have you but that's pretty general what i found that was so empowering about that is there's so many egos in racing there's sort of the expectation that you're going to go out and you're going to know everything that there is to know and it's just you know whoever's got the fastest car the best setup is is going to win that day well when you look at it from that perspective at least for me it was like, all right, the first year is literally just figuring this out. It's so difficult just to figure out where you parked your car and when to go and which way to go. And then second year, let's learn all that there is a track and how we drive a track and everything that's involved in that. And what it was, was it was, it was an okay to take this as something that you learn over time. You don't have to know it all the first time that you go out. So no. that, that has always stuck with me. Yeah, that's it's really important. It's unfair to be like a, a champion right out of the gate. It's like, and if you really look at it, that doesn't happen very often. And when it does, there's a set of facts that kind of they're a little skewed, <laughs> you know. So be kind to yourself, man. This is take this as a craft. Take this as something like woodworking. You don't just all of a sudden make a armoire, <laughs> you know. You don't. You're not just all of a sudden wood guy or shipbuilder you, you got to freaking gnaw on a two by four for a minute you know it takes a while yep and have fun with it because if you're not having fun doing it then why are you doing it 
Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, take it easy on yourself. Gab one thing and start creating a map. That sounds great. Mike, thank you for the advice. Um, guys, that's going to be our show for today. Uh, as always, if you have any topics or thoughts, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if there are things that Mike and I can chat about or questions that you've got about autocrossing, racing, car setup, Mustangs in general, we'd love to sure. hear from you. Even driving on the street. Absolutely. Driving on the street. Our, our bulk customers are street people. That's the bulk of our customers. We like racing, so we race. Mm -hmm. But if you're on your street driving your car and something sucks about it, ask a question. Well, and the reality is we learn a lot from racing that applies to the street. All of these things that we've talked about in terms of feel and repetition and things that make you go, eh, that definitely applies to street cars just as much as it does to race cars. More so. Mm -hmm. Because you can give a, a race car guy side pipes and a big burnout and he's stoked, right? <laughs> did a burnout, made a lot of noise. But when you put his wife in the car and say, now drive three hours to wherever you're going. That better be a good car. You know, that's a thing. So it's, it's street stuff. You really got to work hard at it and it's not easy to build a good car. And so be a kind to yourself there too. You know, everything, like you're saying, we do learn from racing. If we didn't race, we wouldn't bring up these spring questions and shock questions and ball joint things and geometry. And then you immediately apply it to your customers and, and on the street. And they don't really know other than the fact that the car is just really nice, mm -hmm. you know, and they don't know why or the years that went into it. They just know, well, I got the stuff from Meyer and it was really, really nice. That was a lot of work to get there. Definitely. So if you have questions about riding around the street, let us know. Drop a comment in the notes below or shoot us an email. Um, we look forward to hearing from you guys. So, Mike, again, thank you for the time this morning. Uh, I'm Kyle. We'll get together again here in a couple weeks to have more Friday morning coffee at MMI. All right, guys. See ya. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Bye.